pediatric speech language pathologist and welcome to teach me to talk the podcast today we're going to be continuing the autism podcast series with a discussion about imitation now if you were on my daily email list i really talked about last week that this week we were going to be uh, beginning our discussion about expressive language development in children with autism so if you're not on that daily email list get on there so that you don't miss any of that really important information but secondly you may have been expecting the show to have a title like expressive language development but this is where expressive language development starts is with imitation particularly well with all kids really but particularly with autism with kids that already have that formal diagnosis or kids who have a lot of red flags for autism this is so hard for them and that's what we're going to be talking about today in this show is how uh, children with autism learn how to imitate okay and all this information before we get started if you are wondering if this is your first time here and you've just landed right in the middle of this series Series, you can get the written copy of this information from my latest treatment manual called the Autism Workbook, Developing Speech Therapy Treatment Plans for Toddlers and Preschoolers with Red Flags for ASD. And that's exclusively at my website at teachmetotalk.com and you can find the uh, link below. So we're gonna be uh, talking about this information. And actually in that workbook, let me say one thing about that. There are 12 focus areas that when we think about developing comprehensive treatment plans for uh, toddlers, meaning kids in that birth to three developmental phase, and then young preschoolers, kids that are three and four. Uh, when we talk about kids who have red flags for autism, there are really 12 specific areas that we look at. Seven of those are, are kind of what I have come to think about as my key focus areas, and then five are supplemental. But we're going to be talking about today is piece number six in that. So if you have not seen our previous shows in this series, go back and listen to those, beginning with show 401 that talks about explaining uh, autism to parents, and then the next show, Meeting a Child Where He Is, uh, Teach Social Games First, and we talked a lot about uh, developing uh, turn-taking skills and joint attention. We spent some time talking about play skills and receptive language skills too. So get caught up in this series if, if this is the first show that you're joining in because lots of times we just tend to focus on that expressive language piece with any child, but, but who's not talking yet. But again, specifically for parents with autism, they sometimes will say to me, if I can just get him to talk, all of that other stuff will fall into place. Here's the truth. <laughs> when all that other stuff falls into place, then he'll talk. <laughs> and a, a lot of times, even we as therapists kind of have that backwards. Or when we get a verbal kid with autism, we really hyper-focus on that verbal piece when really those foundational skills that we've talked about that I just went through that list are missing or weak. And we need to spend a lot of time strengthening those things before we can get to the expressive language piece. So even if you're thinking, okay, 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 I get it. You, you, you know, I, I know that you're gonna say that there are all these prerequisite skills. Actually, imitation is one of the most important skills for language development uh, expressively. And a child's imitation skills are directly tied to his further language development. So it is so important that we get this going. As early as possible in all late talkers, but particularly in children with autism. So uh, let's get going with this. So what does imitating mean? Of course, it means that you what? You copy or you repeat. And that's how all of us learn everything throughout our lifetimes is watching someone else do it and then doing it ourselves. And that's probably what you're doing right now. You are watching this show or listening to this show uh, so that you can get further information so that you can what? do something. You want to be able to repeat or copy something that you've heard. If you're a therapist, it might even be my words in the scripts that you say or uh, advice or uh, counseling that you do with parents. For parents, you might be thinking, oh, she said this game and, and she said that game. And so that's what you're doing too. You're imitating me. And that's how children learn as well. And so we need to uh, 
think think about that and think about how important that is. And so if we have a little guy with autism or a little girl, I tend to kind of err on this side of uh, little boys with this since autism is more common in boys than girls. But um, we, we need to think about imitation as a watch and do process. So if you have a little guy who even is saying a lot, and we'll talk about echolalia as we continue throughout uh, today's show and throughout the rest of the shows in this series. Uh, if you have a little guy who's really, really verbal, but yet you see he doesn't really connect with people. He's not really playing very much. He's not following very many commands. This is the kind of kid that we're talking about today. And so we want to be sure that we're not leaving those kids out. And so if you're thinking, oh, I don't really need this show because I have this little guy who already imitates words, and, and that's fantastic. That is fantastic. But again, if he seems to be stalled, if play skills aren't developing like you would like for them to, or even something like uh, independent self-help skills. He's having a really hard time uh, learning the steps to go uh, when he's becoming toilet trained. Those kinds of things are rooted in imitation. He needs to be able to watch other people or uh, if you're using something like a picture schedule or, or you know, that that's a, sort of a related skill. My point here is that he is looking at something and then he is doing something. And that really is all connected neurologically in typically developing children and kids with special needs with uh, that process with imitation. And it's so embedded even in infancy. And so there's a lot of research that tells us that children with autism actually learn how to imitate differently. Before we get there, I've jumped ahead. Let's, let, me, let me tell you these, these things first to be sure um, that you get them before we move into that research. As speech language pathologists or parents of children who have red flags with, uh, for autism or already a formal diagnosis, Imitation is the most important skill that you're going to teach every child with autism who is not talking yet. And again, we already talked about that little uh, that little caveat there that even if they are echolalic and are pretty verbal, we still may need to back up and teach uh, this very basic step. And remember that I said too, and even if this is the second or third time, I've repeated this already in the 10 minutes since the show started, a child's ability to imitate is directly related to his rate of progress with adding new words to his vocabulary. So until we get a child work through these levels of imitating, we're not going to see a lot of progress with expressive language development. So we want to be sure that we uh, know why imitation is important. And if you are a therapist and watching this, that's what you need to be saying to parents. Look, this is why we're going to teach him how to talk because this is direct or teach him how to imitate because his ability to imitate is directly related to how well he's going to talk six months from now, one year from now. And actually the research says when we look at typically developing children that how well they, well, actually this would be all children. How well the child imitates at 18 months is so predictive for how well he talks or his expressive language uh, level at 36 months. So again, all kids, this is really, really uh, significant for. So the earlier we get imitation going, the better. All right, so now this is what I was uh, trying to jump ahead to talk about because it's so important and it's really the starting point for how we think about kids with autism and how we're going to treat them as, as they uh, begin to develop language. And so we want to think about what, be, because they're diagnosed with autism or because they have the red flags for autism, we know that they have some learning differences. And lots of researchers believe that the, the difference with autism actually kind of begins with that missing or skill or absence of imitation because of the way that children are neurologically wired. They don't have the same, uh, let's see, receptors, we could maybe call it, or the same, um, same motivation, same built-in wiring to uh, want to watch people. And so that social component or the motor piece, and we're going to talk about these things as we go and kind of analyze how significantly that affects uh, children who have characteristics of autism. And think about imitation too. Oh, I wanted to tell you my favorite researchers in this area are Brooke Ingersoll, who's an educator. So if you are a developmental interventionist and watching this, you know, woohoo, kudos to somebody in your field for really, really studying imitation to this degree and her um, especially 10 years ago or so, 15 years ago, when I really decided, yeah, I'm going to 
I'm going to double down on this <laughs> uh, with really, really learning how to treat autism and just, you know, from a personal perspective, my own caseload, but just wanting to be better and better and better. I, I read a lot of things that she wrote. You can Google her name and get some things. And then Sally Rogers, who is just a, a phenomenal author. If you haven't read any of her resources for autism, that's a, gr a great start. You can just Google her name and get her list of resources there. But they also, again, academically have provided so much research for us. Uh, extensively on the topic of imitation and how this is really, really the key area that we need to focus on with kids with autism so that they can begin to uh, learn to communicate, learn to talk. Uh, and let me say one thing about imitation, how important it is. There are whole fields built around this. That's ABA is really, really uh, centered on in the beginning teaching children, you know, do what I do, copy, copy what I do, and as a speech language pathologist, and again, especially before I really understood ABA and how to correctly apply those principles, I would really say things like, well, I don't like that they say that because I want them to say, give the kid the language. If they're gonna say, you know, do this, I want them to say, touch your nose, or do this, I'd like for them to say, point to your ear. And I get now that they are really working on that imitation piece. They don't want to gunk it up and overload that child's system with so many directions when they are really, really, really breaking down uh, that skill to just get to the bare bones level of imitation. And so as a child matures and as his language developments develops, we certainly should include those kinds of receptive language commands, you know, point to your ear, touch your nose. But I get now why they're working on imitation so hard at the beginning. And that's a real clue for us too, as SLPs or developmental interventionists or OTs, you know, we don't have that same training with ABA. So again, our skill sets and maybe how we look at children uh, is going to be through definitely a different lens because I, I use the term cognitive development all the time. And that's a real, uh, it's not a word embraced or used by uh our colleagues in ABA, but that's okay because we uh, we can uh, pick the things that we think, oh my goodness, this focus on imitation. Yeah, that's what we need to be doing uh, when we're looking at speech language development too. All right, so let's look at three specific challenges that toddlers with ASD experience that make learning to imitate difficult. First of all, and I already mentioned this, and pardon me while I grab a drink here, Toddlers with autism have limited social referencing and a decreased level of engagement with others. So if you're a therapist, you get that. But if you're a parent, what does that mean? They have difficulty looking at other people and wanting to be with other people and wanting to connect with other people. Now, if you were a mom, you might be thinking, my child has autism, but he, he is very connected to me. Absolutely but you have to look at how he connects with others, especially those outside your immediate family. And usually there's a big distinction. A child may be almost hyper connected to his mom and only his mom or his mom and you know, maybe his grandmother that he sees uh, almost every day and certainly dad, but a lot of times that circle is really, really small for a child with autism or red flags for autism. And so you'll see them Again, you can't always go with their level of eye contact with their mom, or you may not see avoidance with the mom because they seem to seek, seek their moms out. And again, that's fantastic because their mom is their person. And if that's you, you know, I know that your heart is, is filling right now with uh, just kind of thinking about that. You are, you are your child's person. You are his connection to everything else and thank god he is so connected with you and that is wonderful and i if i were with you i'd just give you a big hug and say you did such a good job helping him learn to be socially connected with you because it's so hard for him with other people and so we've got to really look at how that is with other people so that we can say yeah that is a problem with him he doesn't watch other people like he should and see and again until you can watch another person consistently for longer than a millisecond, like a lot of our little guys' attention spans are, 
that that's the that's how it starts that's how imitation starts by watching somebody else by listening to what they're saying and so that is such an important missing connection for so many children with autism because they really really struggle with that social engagement piece and so they're not watching other people long enough so the quantity piece or well enough the qualitative piece uh, they're not doing that well enough for imitation to really even have had a chance to develop yet and so for those kids we have to help them learn to consistently watch us and connect with us because we cannot teach a child to imitate until he's consistently uh, connected to us so if you're a therapist and you've been working a lot on imitation and you're not getting anywhere and you're thinking that's that's what's wrong is that he's you know I spend so much of my time trying to chase him down and belt him into a high chair or whatever it is that you're doing to try to contain him but really here you should probably work on making that connection and making it as genuinely and as authentically as you can I believe the best way to do that is by teaching social games first and working on that social piece and that connection and then the skills that evolve just really around that with developing turn taking and joint uh, joint attention and so you can go back and listen to those shows I think think those are shows 403 and 404 404 I think is play but go back and listen uh, look for those terms and listen to those listen to those shows or watch those shows especially teach social games first because in that show there's such a nice breakdown of if a kid is doing this try these social games and if a kid is doing that if this is his strength try these social games and that is so important for kids who aren't imitating yet because you know that mm, he's not watching me closely enough he's not connected with me well enough yet so go back and do that because we know that inherently toddlers with autism and pre preschoolers with autism are struggling with that social piece that that's that's a part of autism right that's one of the defining characteristics all right the second difference that we notice in children uh, who go on to be diagnosed with autism uh, with imitation is that many toddlers with autism also struggle with the motor planning piece and with motor coordination so what does that mean that means that up here in their little brains and again this is such a simplistic explanation and if you're a therapist and you like to use more professional terminology or uh, more you want to sound more academic go for it you know do that but this is how I explain it and this is what seems to work for the majority of parents and sometimes I'll just tell you I've had the privilege over my career of working with lots of children of therapists and physicians neurologists children you know uh, uh, developmental pediatricians children and sometimes in the especially gosh 20 years ago in my career i probably would have tried so hard to impress them with my vocabulary and my just little understanding of, of neurology you know based on and i don't mean to diminish what we know as a field uh, about neurology and speech language pathology because we've been trained in that but certainly not to the extent that you think about the neurologist and I would try so hard sometimes to come up with these very professional sounding descriptions and you know what a lot of times it was just when I dropped all of that and just talked about it and even talked about it in these just really simplistic layman's terms that parents really tell me how much they appreciated that because sometimes with our own children there's a big disconnect and certainly if you are a therapist and you've had a child who's had some learning differences or uh, even a medical diagnosis that would make him have special needs uh, throughout his life whether that be physically or educationally you know there's a disconnect sometimes between uh, what we know as a professional as Larmai's MSCCC SLP versus Larmai's mom and there is a big difference there sometimes so even when we use even when we're working with families who are highly educated we still need to make sure that we are offering enough of this real life advice because a lot of times the spouse of that highly educated person will say you know that that made that made sense to me I'm glad you explained it that way or they'll say that's what I want to tell my mom that's what I'm going to tell his sitter when she comes this is a better way to explain it and so certainly these kind of simplistic definitions or simplistic examples you may get no benefit from but I, I bet some of you will so let's get back to that what is motor planning and motor coordination what 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 does that mean the official diagnostic uh 
term for that, label for that, is apraxia. And so a really simplistic uh, diagnosis or definition or explanation for that is there's really, you know, nothing going on motor-wise that you can see. It's going to all be up here. Even though a child has the idea of what he wants to do with his body or what he wants to say with his mouth or even how he wants to sign something or even how he plays, sometimes he can't get it from here to here or here to here to his mouth. And I hope that makes sense to you. And sometimes I'll say something like, it short circuits along the way. And again, that's not really what happens neurologically, but that's an explanation that parents can really, really understand. Or the one that's kind of the classic explanation with apraxia with, with, and the description that parents like is, you know, with motor planning and motor coordination, when a child is struggling with that, it is like the road is Bumpy. It is like we are comparing his bumpy little jungle path with how he want, we want him to get that word out or how we want him to get that movement out, even if it's something like clapping. He will, it, it, will, it takes a lot of effort. And compare riding a bicycle with two flat tires over a bumpy jungle path or a path in the woods, whatever makes sense to you, versus an interstate that's that's new. You know, we, we don't need road work yet. The the road is smooth. It is it it is it is ready, just open and waiting for that car, that vehicle, that message, if you will, to just glide over that surface. And so that's kind of the difference with motor planning. It's not that the kid it's not that he doesn't know what he wants to say or know what he wants to do. It's just that he can't get it there. There's effort there. And so that's that's really common with kids with autism. There's a study, and I wish I had the reference right now, that says, I'll try to find that. It's in my Is It Autism course. So if you have that course, I'm going to go back and I need that reference. <clears throat> Pardon me, or I'll try to remember to link it. But sometimes I cite that on the show, and I completely forget. So forgive me if that happens. Pardon me, I took a drink if you're uh, listening to a par podcast and wondering what happened with that silence there. But some studies say that over 60% of children with autism also have apraxia. Now, here's the rub with that. Sometimes when we say apraxia to a mom or a dad or a grandparent or whoever loves that child, a teacher, when we say apraxia to a teacher, they forget about autism and what we're saying and what we can say with that study is it's not just autism and it's not just apraxia it's both because lots of kids with autism the study that i'm referencing found that just over 60 percent i think it's 63 percent of children uh, with autism also have motor planning issues or apraxia and again it can be differentiated it can, this show is not about apraxia but while we're talking about it let's just say this you can have global apraxia, meaning that a child has difficulty with motor planning throughout his body. So these would be kids who maybe have difficulty climbing a ladder when they're on the playground. They may have difficulty sequencing, uh, how do I get in the swing? You know, they, they just have trouble even moving their bodies from in, in gross motor activities, so all over their bodies. So global apraxia, those kids have a lot of difficulty learning how to write when they become preschoolers and school-aged children because uh, that's just so difficult for them. They might have a lot of uh, difficulty even with something like buttoning, so fine motor tasks too, and that can certainly... Uh, or zipping. They just don't even understand sometimes how to do the zipper until we show them and 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 show them. And that's when that motor plan becomes more automatic. Remember that example that I gave you about the bumpy jungle path or the bumpy path in the woods, the bike path versus the super highway. So um, th that's, that's what we're talking about there. It's just they're every when it looks like it's uncoordinated and when it looks like they're really struggling they are and even though they may have it here and that's why sometimes parents of kids with apraxia will say gosh i know he knows what he wants to say i mean i can see it all over him and we as therapists when we get to know children 
but we know that too. We think that too, right? And so that that's certainly we. That's why they have trouble imitating us, though, because they can't make <laughs> their mouth say it. Or the, and I'll see kids, maybe not a child with autism, but other kids with apraxia who that's their only diagnosis, not kind of a not a, a comorbidity there or a secondary diagnosis or it's a kid with only an apraxia diagnosis might even try to move his mouth sometimes, especially if you've done some prompts with him and some physical cues, some tactile cueing to get his, uh, you know, you might cue his little lips to get lip closure and then you'll see him doing it because they know, gosh, I can't make my mouth do this yet. And so it's that repetition and that practice. And so, um, Certainly, we see that in children with autism. And remember, too, um, that speech is a motor skill. Even though we think about it, language is its own entity or developmental domain. That's true. But when it all comes down to it, speech really is a fine motor skill. So when we see kids that are really struggling out here for uh, motor coordination and motor planning, we know they're probably going to struggle verbally with that. And I started saying about, uh, when I was talking about apraxia, you can have global apraxia or dyspraxia as uh, some therapists have been trained. Uh, and really it's, we use them interchangeably. Dyspraxia is supposed to be uh, a little less serious or less significant. You know, apraxia, when we look at that A, that means a is without and praxis remember what that means that means movement so that would be without movement uh, and the dis you know certainly is the discoordinated or dysfunctional however however what's the official uh meaning for that prefix there but certainly um we think about those as therapists we think about that interchangeably so the global piece versus a child can just have an oral apraxia which you know, would have to do again with the verbal piece or, or I'm sorry, the nonverbal piece and then the verbal piece, verbal apraxia. So an oral apraxia is going to be when kids also have difficulty uh, with imitating your movements. And a lot of times these kids are going to have difficulty with feeding too, but because of a sensory perspective, not necessarily a muscle tone issue. And that's the next thing that we want to move on to is the third problem that we we're talking about or the third difference with children with autism uh, that affects their ability to imitate is some kids with autism and this is around 30 percent also have low muscle tone and so this will really impact a child's ability to speak and again if they have global issues with muscle tone like we see uh, certainly in our kids uh, with down syndrome or cerebral palsy if they're of uh, the cerebral palsy that they have uh, has affected them in this way you can have high tone or low tone we're really talking about low tone here um so it's not going to be that problem isn't going to just be limited in one area it's not just their mouth so they're also going to have kids with low muscle tone have difficulty uh, acquiring their gross motor milestones so kids who were late to sit up uh, late to creep or crawl, uh, late late to walk, who kids who really have some differences with their gait. So those kinds of kids certainly are going to have difficulty learning how to imitate. And just from a motoric or a physical standpoint, it's harder for them to move their little bodies. It's harder. And again, we talked about kids with apraxia have some difficulty with that, but it's not because of strength or because anything's really different about their muscles or their bodies. But here, it would be a difference. There are obvious differences. And again, sometimes therapists get kind of crazy about looking at a kid and saying, he's got low muscle tone and I want to go, why do you think that? You know, because you need to see low muscle tone. You need to see uh, lower tone in a kid's face so that makes their faces a little uh, droopier. You might think about it as baby fat, but you know, they're just a little padded. You know, thinking about me and my little COVID weight gain, you probably think about that about me too. But my point is here, you can see it. They'll drool when they try to stick their tongues out. You can see they may have difficulty really lateralizing their tongues or even things like licking a sucker or eating a popsicle, those kinds of things. You can see they have other feeding problems too. They may have some difficulty with chewing. You may even see some difficulty with different textures, even with with swallowing. It may have been hard for them to transition to solids. So there will be obvious evidences of low muscle tone when you see that. But my point here is when kids have difficulty with that social piece, or difficulty with the motor piece, meaning motor planning, motor coordination, nothing wrong with the muscles. It's just that coordination piece, getting it from here to 
here, you know, here to here, here to here, uh, or then with low tone, you know, if there are those obvious muscle things, that's the reason that they're not imitating. And so that's what we have to think about and kind of isolate. Now, here's the, here's the kicker, the, especially with the, the things that we just talked about with the low muscle tone. The things that we do for low muscle tone for lots of kids, and certainly we're going to think about overall low muscle tone, the whole body, we need to have PT and OT involved with those kids. And um, certainly we need to think about um, the things that we do as speech language pathologists, maybe so focused oral motor exercises. And we know that certainly those have fallen out of favor because the research doesn't say that they result in better intelligibility. And that kind of thing, we're going to talk about this a little bit later as it pertains to the treatment things that we do. But sometimes with our kids with low muscle tone with autism, the things that we need to do in and around their mouths, it's just impossible because it's just going to be a relationship killer. <laughs> and so, you know, if you are doing some tactile cues or you're trying to do some prompting or whatever that you're doing to sort of get this going, or even from a sensory perspective, let's say that they have some feeding issues and you're, you really want to get in there and see what you can do to help normalize their... Um, receptivity to anything in and around their mouth, you can't do it because they are so averse to that. So sometimes you think, gosh, the things that they would have learned how to do are the things that I would normally do. I, I can't do, you know, that's not happening on either end. And, and that's just, that's the nature of working with very young children. Sometimes the things that we want to do that we know will will eventually be very, very helpful for them and very beneficial. We can't do it yet because we don't have that relationship established and they don't have that social connection. And if we do it, it's just going to kill everything else. So I'm a relationship person. <laughs> I really believe in that one-on-one -on -one connection. And if I have a kid who, who just freaks out and doesn't want me to do it, I'm not going to waste a lot of our time. I'm going to tell mom some basic things to do and we will move toward that, but I'm not going to lament that whole process. All right. So Basically, when we've talked about those differences, we've got to figure out if the problem with imitating with a child is a social problem, if it's a motor planning problem, or a low tone problem. And I gave you some ways to think about that, but here's what you need to do. You need to observe the child when you're trying to teach him to do something. And what is his reaction? If he runs away, what is that? Usually that's a social connection problem. Now, it could be that you've made it. He's, it's so hard for him, motor planning wise, that he's so frustrated he gets out of there. But a lot of times it is that social connection piece. So what were we going to do for those kids? We're going to back up and work on social games and getting that connection really, really established before we try to teach them how to imitate. If we see a kid who's sort of trying to imitate but he's off target, and one of my best examples with this is this is a little boy, and gosh, let's see, he was two in 2008. So you do the math. That's how old he would be. But he was a little boy that I, and he I was likely on the spectrum. He was undiagnosed when I saw him. But instead of signing please on his chest, he would try to sign it on his back. And he would do all kinds of other with signs, modify them. But that was the most dramatic thing because I remember thinking, is he scratching his back? What's going on? And then the third or fourth time he did it, I thought, he he's trying to sign, please. He's imitating me when I'm signing, please. And I honestly did not get it until he had done it two or three times. And that is just so just engraved in my memory with that with that with how off sometimes that motor planning can be or if you've done some signs and again signing is not always recommended for kids with autism because of the specific reasons that we're talking about here but you've just tried to get that going and you know they are you you they, they start with more every single time no matter what sign you cue that's usually a motor planning issue. And so what do you have to do? You have to work on motor planning. A lot of times I'll try to start with play with those kinds of kids. And again, that gross motor movement, not necessarily imitation, but just to get those those pieces working and uh, again we're working on social connections with those kids too but we know gosh you know we're really going to look at a practice for these kids because this is this is uh probably what's going on and then with low time we talked about that how you can see those differences you can see if they're floppy or if they drool a lot or again if they had those late motor milestones so that'll kind of help you see you know a lot of times with kids with autism they have both they'll have the social piece and 
<laughs> one of those other motor things. And so look for that with kids. And again, sometimes it's just that, just our mindset, just with gosh, this is why he's not imitating. It's not that he's a little stinker. This isn't about behavior. This is about when I get a better social connection with him and when I get his motor system a little more revved up and go into the right direction and he's regulated and he's on, that's what I need to do before I teach him how to imitate. And I'm not going to waste my time trying to belt him in a high chair or make him do these things or come up with a behavior modification plan when really I know this is a neurological problem and I need to treat it like that. So I hope that gives you some insight there. All right, before we move on, let's talk about the verbal kids with autism that have mastered verbal imitation. Who are those kids? And those those kids, what, they're imitating too much almost. And we've talked about this. This is echolalia and that's where they quote uh, things that they've heard other people say as well as scenes from movies and their favorite books or their favorite shows and even though those children are talking they're really really not communicating they're the things that they're saying you know to infinity and beyond or uh what's the one for paw patrol uh, rough rough ready or something like that but they whatever they're using it's really not communicative yet but you're saying, Laura, those kids have learned how to imitate. But here's here's the thing you need to be working on a lot with kids with echolalia. We'll talk about how to kind of, as we are going through the levels of imitation here, I'll talk about what I do specifically with those kids. But the first thing I want to say for those kids is that you need to work on receptive language. And we talked about that a lot in uh, the last show. So go back 406. Go back and listen to that or watch that show because you'll get some really practical ways to start working on receptive language uh, with those kinds of kids. And you know, the problem with them isn't talking. <laughs> they know how to talk. They're not communicating. So what does that mean? The words don't make sense yet. They don't really understand what they're saying yet, but it is so good they can talk. I mean, that is a silver lining if there ever were one. So uh, the kids with echolalia too, uh, well, I, I won't even say that yet. I'll save that for our further discussion. So, but let's move back to the kids with autism or red flags for autism who aren't imitating because that's really the focus of, of this podcast. So usually when kids aren't talking um, or uh, using toys, so their play skills, and we talked a lot about that a couple of shows back, or using gestures. The problem is there that they're not watching somebody else, like we said before, long enough or well enough to do what they do, and then again, there might be a motor piece there. Probably there's another overlay, uh, 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 motor piece that's overlaid, I guess that's what I'm trying to say. But once we teach them to imitate, teaching every other skill after this will get a lot easier. Not only talking, but teaching them how to play and getting them to really watch you as you play and do what you do, that is going to be huge for those kids. And so here, this is going to be just a real backbone of our uh, treatment plan. But again, even for kids who aren't talking yet, and I say this every time I teach anything about imitation, and boy, I, I've taught a lot on imitation, but I, I'm just going to say it. Even if you've taken three other courses that I've taught about it. We cannot start with words <laughs> when we're teaching a late talker or a kid with autism or a kid with anything or any reason that he's not uh, talking yet. We can't start with words. We've got to back up to easier, earlier things. So why can't we start with words if words are the problem? Because it's usually not where the breakdown occurs. The breakdown with that child actually occurs way back in that developmental process. And again, we're specifically talking about imitation today. So we're going to look, there's actually a hierarchy, or I call them steps or levels to building verbal imitation in toddlers. And so uh, uh, out of those eight levels, words are number seven. So look, we've got six other things that have to come first. And so if you have the autism workbook, um, you, there's a great chart about that on page 118. If you've not bought Autism Workbook yet, but you have Building Verbal Imitation Skills in Toddlers, you can see another version of that chart, the, the uh, first version, the one that kind of refers to all kids in uh, that book, but I redid it for Autism Workbook. And you can look, if you are purchasing 
um, credit, continuing education credit for this course. And I hope that you will, because if you're taking the time to watch the show or listen to the show, if you're a therapist, you need to get your credit. You can do that at teachmetotalk.com. But when you purchase a credit for the show, you'll get a handout. Now, a lot of parents go ahead and pay the five bucks, even though they don't need the credit because they want the handouts. The handouts have been so helpful to them throughout the series. And if that's you, I want, and, you and if you've emailed me about it, I want to thank you uh, for that, for that feedback, because I certainly have enjoyed doing that. Uh, but you can look at your summary right there and look at those eight levels of imitation. And so what's the first level there? It's imitating actions with objects. So remember we said we're going to work our way toward words. Well, guess what? We're going to work our way toward talking. So the first phase there uh, is that a kid will have an, a toy or an object and you have that too and you show him what to do and then he copies you right after that. And first we start with expected actions. So if you are sitting and playing with a kid with a drumstick and, you, and a drum and you give him the drumstick, what do you expect him to do? Beat the drum with the drumstick, right? But here's the thing, with imitation and with what we're working on here, you want him to do what you are doing. And even though that action is expected, you want to move that along so that you can be sure that imitation is really, really happening. So you may beat on the drum with the stick. You may hold it in the air. You may wave it around. You may sit on it. You may blow on it, but blowing because he's doing something with his mouth is actually a little harder. But you might do any number of things with that drumstick. The purpose here isn't we're going to teach him how to play with toys, although that's a great benefit <laughs> because a lot of our little guys with autism are stuck on their own little fixations they may only play with Thomas the train and really ignore other things and so when we start at this basic level of imitation their play skills do improve and that's actually where I discovered Brooke Ingersoll's work she's done a lot of research about that and just how important that uh, teaching a child how to take an object that you have and then just to do what you do right after that how critical that is and what an important skill that is particularly for children with autism and ABA focuses on that, and as SLPs, we should too. So uh, actions with objects, that's number one. And I love the how we I redid the chart in Autism Workbook because it's a little bit different. You've got the level here and the actions, or the what you, you know, the number here, the description of what the step is or the level is, and then lots of examples here. And I try to pull things for this that were specific examples from children with autism that I've treated over the years. So I hope that they are really relevant when you look at that. And I like how we redid it too because it lists all the levels. And we've just talked about level one, actions with objects, but it has there for your reference, you can check mastered, meaning that a child does it most of the time. He, and we're not just looking at what he does. Remember, we're looking at how well he imitates these specific things. And then we have emerging and then we have absence. So if we've never seen a kid imitate uh, or heard him imitate any of these uh, areas, we would check it as absent. So why is this important? And we'll talk about this a little, when we get through the levels, we'll talk about it more, but emerging skills are so important because that's where we start therapy. We don't really want to start with something that's so hard that a kid has never, ever, ever done before. Even if that's our goal, even if our goal is we want him to say words, but he's nonverbal and he hardly... Uh, connects with anyone. He, his attention span is, you know, just two seconds and then he's gone. He's out of there. He only has really specific objects or items that he likes to play with. Everything else he just kind of ignores or discards. And so again, you can see that you cannot start with imitating words with a kid like that. And so, um, you know, that's, that's what we want to talk about as we move forward here and looking at where those levels are. So we did number one, uh, level one, actions with objects. We're going to show him how to use a toy and uh, want him to copy us and repeat us. And that could even be a familiar object at home too. So like when you're in the bathroom with him, if you, if you uh, show him how to, if you brush your hair, can you hand him the brush and he'll start to brush his own hair? Or is he going to do something else with it? Is he going to spin it around? Is he going to throw it in the bathtub? You know, what's he going to do with it? And so we really, really want to get that imitation uh, really, really established. I think I was going somewhere else with a comment a second ago, but it'll, it'll come back to me with that. All right. Um, so that was level one. 
And that's, uh, we talked about moving from expected actions with objects to unexpected actions with objects. And remember why we do that is we wanna make sure that a child is imitating, not just doing what he would do even if you weren't there. All right, so when a kid can do that, we move on to that next level, which is imitating body movements and communicative gestures. So body movements are gonna be things that he does with his body. So if you jump, will he jump? If you kick in the air, will he kick in the air? If you, um, you know, wave your arms, is he gonna wave your arms? Any of those little things. Uh, hand motions to songs. If you are singing, if you're happy and you know it, clap your hands. Will he do that with you? Will he imitate that motor action with you? And again, why is that important? Because we want kids watching us and doing what we do. And again, we talked about how imitation really, and, and motor skills really develop. It's always out here, gross first, and then we refine it. <coughs> Excuse me, so because speech, as we already said, is a fine motor skill. All right, and we take those body movements as a child is kind of in this developmental level, and we refine those body movements so that they become communicative gestures. So can you think of something that a child could imitate from you, an action that really means something else? That would be like waving bye-bye or pointing, what does that mean? That means I want that, or look at that, right? Or clapping generally means what? Yay, or I'm excited, or good job, or, you know, so, so we wanna take this gross motor imitation, this body movement imitation, and we wanna shape it so that it becomes communicative. And gestures are so hard for kids with autism. We've talked about that a little bit, but we'll talk about that um, in a few more shows too with expressive language development, but with gestures, that's one of the diagnostic characteristics of autism is that kids have trouble understanding and using nonverbal communication. So that's why it's so hard to teach them to wave bye-bye, or that's why, you know, sometimes we're teaching their head shake, yes and no, you don't know which one you're getting because they're kind of all over the place. And so again, it's that motor planning piece and it's that, uh, that that's, one of the, that's one of the reasons they're diagnosed with autism, okay? It's one of the defining, diagnostic uh, official criteria. And so, you know, you just kind of know that, how hard this is gonna be for some of those kids. But here's why we have to get gestures going. Number one, they're extremely predictive for language development because we know in typical development and even in kids with other kinds of language delays uh, that are not autism, not on the autism spectrum, gestures come first. And they typically emerge before, just before, uh, we start to hear words. So it's really an important developmental milestone that we want to see, uh, to see kids accomplish. And just two, again, from that uh, autism characteristic that we already talked about, so much communication that we do, even throughout our lifespans as, as adults, really depends on uh, nonverbal communication. And so just think about how many times we use gestures throughout the day or other people use gestures to supplement what their auditory systems hopefully are processing. And so we want our little guys to be able to watch and again, uh, do those things uh, because they're so important communicatively. So you can, uh, that, that's the next step. That's what we teach next. And again, I'm not gonna over teach this because we have this information in so many other courses and I will link those at the bottom, but that was the next thing that we teach them when we're teaching them how to imitate. Level three, we're kind of moving on up. Remember we started with actions with objects way out here and then we did our body movements uh, and gestures out here and now, now we move it on up to the mouth, but now we're not ready to add sound. We just want them to be nonverbal actions with their face and their mouth. So uh, things like opening and closing their mouths or uh, uh, moving their, wiggling their tongue from side to side or just uh, any kind of little uh, blowing raspberries, any kind of motor movement that you do here that does not have a sound connected with it. All right, so this is a little bit controversial for speech language pathologists because we know oral motor exercises have fallen out of favor and there's not a lot of evidence with studies that show that we have positive outcomes that can be correlated to speech. But <laughs> we are not looking at that. We are looking at how well a child learns how to imitate. And we are making this, we are taking this skill of imitation and we are breaking it down to those earliest developmental levels. And so doing things with your mouth, kids start to do this even in infancy, 
uh, that that just that baby period, that six to nine month period when they first start to babble. We haven't added the, the sound piece, but again, we're looking at how we can kind of break that down. And let me just say, so many kids with autism will struggle with this. Again, because of the imitation, uh, how hard imitation is for them. So this is not necessarily a step that you have to do with every single child, but it is kind of my backup point. Do you know what I mean by that? The backup to point. When I am having difficulty to getting a kid forward, let's say that I just cannot get him to do these next levels with play sounds and exclamatory words. I just can't get him to copy anything verbally. I just, I just cannot get him to do that. Then I'll think, oh boy, I better back up to this level and see what I can get him to do here. And so that's certainly something that I've done with kids with autism. So anything like smacking your lips, sticking out your tongue, uh, those little things, again, kids who struggle socially are going to have a difficult time doing that because they may not be looking at your face. And then certainly we've talked about kids with low tone are going to have difficulty with their strength with that. And then kids with motor planning, it's just that coordination piece. How do I make my tongue do that or make my mouth do that? And so many little guys with autism seem to not even know they have a mouth. <laughs> so for those kids, or even kids who've had a lot of feeding aversions or feeding problems, we really sometimes do have to do that as kind of a focus thing. We don't do that with everybody, but some kids really, really need it. And so when we see that that would benefit them and that there's not, uh, you know, we're, I'm not talking about using prompt or any kind of, uh, invasive thing where I'm touching them or putting anything in their mouths. I'm just talking about them copying what I do. So those little games are certainly different and we can certainly draw a line that uh, why we're doing it. We have a strong clinical reason to do that. All right, the next level we were going to teach kids how to imitate. We're still not to words, but we're getting there because now we're going to add the verbal piece or something for a kid to say as he moves his mouth. So we made it just a little bit harder. So here's where a child would imitate vocalizations like sound effects. So things that we hear early in typically developing babies, fake coughing, fake sneezing, Amazing. Uh, any kind of little sound that's not really a word, like a like a car sound or something like that. Screaming in the middle of a game, you know, where you're all, ah, you know, screaming like that. Or uh, panting like a dog. <laughs> any of those little vocalizations in play where you can hear, uh, hear something with that. Uh, so... That, that's the next level. And then sometimes I kind of combine it with five, level five, which is using exclamatory words. And these are easy, fun, early words. So these are things you can spell. So things like, uh-oh, and whee, or wow, or oh boy, you know, even those little phrases. Um, so, and then animal sounds too that you can spell like meow or woof woof or car sounds like beep beep. Those little play sounds are so important for kids. One, because they're novel, and two, you get them excited about it, and they can usually say it because they may be easier uh, to pronounce, just have easier uh, syllable construction so they can do it. And so you'll see a lot of success with kids at this level. And sometimes we'll get kids, maybe sometimes kids with autism, but a lot of times if we're just looking at like talkers or, or kids with other language delays, this is where we get them. They come to us with... Uh, three word vocabulary and they're all exclamatory words. So they may have five words and mama and baba and you know, three other words like, uh, you know, uh, whoa or something, something that they say all the time. So that's what I mean there. And that's why it's so important to think about these words before we get to real words. And a lot of us as SLPs really haven't been trained like this. And so we jump straight to those real words when this would be easier for kids and you'll get uh, so much more participation, especially if you embed these words in uh, play where the play is just so much fun and high energy and you're, you're making kind of the sound effect as a part of the play. And a lot of times kids will start to imitate that before they even really realize they're imitating and I, I love it when that happens because it's almost as, as much of a surprise to them as it is to us and so certainly um Level four and level five are really important. Level six, automatic speech and verbal routines. This is where we get to words, but they're so tied to context. So this would be where a kid might say go, but only when we say ready, set, 
and then set him up for it, okay? Or when a kid can say three, if he hears you counting one, two, he can say three, but you couldn't say, how many cookies do you want today? He certainly couldn't pop out three or, you know, oh, uh, any other word that we kind of had tied in a verbal routine like that. Let's say we're doing Ring Around the Roses and, you know, we sing uh, ashes, ashes all fall and a kid says down, but then you could ask him in a different context and he couldn't come up with it. So these are words, again, that are just tied to specific routines. And these are fabulous for kids with autism uh, to get them going. Why? Because they like routine. They like the familiar. They like the predictable. They kind of, they, that's one of their strengths is that they can stay the course right so um, we're going to talk about that in just a minute with with why that's not always the best starting point for some kids with uh, autism but for some kids it is so we'll talk about that in just a second and then uh, level seven functional words you know what those are those are words that a kid spontaneously uh, well he imitates them first but then he spontaneously begins to use them to communicate so these are the words that you think about first like mama and ball and milk and baba and those kinds of things that's level seven so finally after we did those six previous levels we got to level seven and then level eight is when a kid begins to combine those words to get short phrases all right so how do you get a kid to imitate well we start where he's currently is and then we work on mastery so what does that mean well in the autism workbook i like to say that when you look at this chart with kids when you look at all eight of these levels you need to really assess you know how many different examples can i think of this or that i know that he's done for me and not that i think he could do things that i have actually seen him do or that a parent is really sure that a kid can do pretty much all the time or certainly most of the time and so when you get to eight to ten examples if you are looking at level one and 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 you've played with that child and uh, you were playing baby dolls and you put the hat on your head and he put the hat on his head that's one you gave the baby doll a drink and he gave the baby doll a drink that's two and so again you go through that and when you get to about eight or ten you say oh I can be pretty comfortable here he's mastered that and so you do that through the whole chart and so when you get to that that's the mastery point but if you just have one or two examples per level he, that's emerging and so where do you start with the kid you start at the lowest level on the chart where skills are emerging and so i hope that makes that a lot more clearer for you or a lot more clear or clearer for you when you're looking at that and here's the thing kids with autism have a lot of splinter skills and they certainly can do it with imitation too or with talking so they may have four or five words but they're not really meaningful they're unpredictable He's not really imitating them. He's just, it's delayed imitation, which means he's on the right track, but we've just got to speed it up because uh, for language learning to be efficient, this imitation has to go pretty quickly and be really, really consistent. And so even when we see that, gosh, he, a kid may have a few words up here, but you really don't see any evidence of these other things he's not using any gestures at all go back and look at level two or even you know level one with a kid like that and say gosh that's where I have to start because I know something's missing here if he were ready for words he would already be doing it that would have already come in so there's some kind of disconnect somewhere he's and, and again it's a splendor skill he's got a skill at a higher level but he's missing easier early skills at earlier developmental levels and so you have to go back and fill that in and and here's the thing too with kids with autism you can't just go with those splinter skills and I know we want to but it's like trying to build and, and this is something I know you've heard before but it's a good example for parents it's like trying to start the roof of the house before you've finished the foundation before you've gotten all the walls up you might have a wall or two up but until you get everything in place that roof is not going to be structurally sound and so that's a good example that parents can kind of, uh, can think about too and so um let me just give you some examples of starting points here because I think that that's uh, so important for us as therapists to kind of think about uh, what we're going to do. And so let's say, hmm, I can't seem to find my notes on this, so I think I'll just have to wing it here. So let's say that you um, have a kid. Well, we've I've already given you some good examples. Let's say that you get a kid and that he's doing a couple of little play sounds. Let's say that he says, uh-oh, when he drops something and he says, uh, let's just say that he says, wow. He'll imitate wow when his mom 
uh, says it, and he might have a snake sound. Some, when he sees a snake, he'll go, S -s -s -s, or his mom might say, sometimes he does, and I'm not even sure if he means it for the snake. What do you know? You know, okay, I'm going to start at play sounds here. That's going to be a good place for me to start. That's going to be where he is developmentally. If mom reports that he has some verbal routine, she'll say, you know, every time I'm putting him in the car, I'll say, close the and he says door, you'll know, okay, verbal routines are a good spot for that kid. So go back and uh, think about that. Uh, I found my notes here. So um, let's say that you're playing with a kid and you show him how to do a toy and he does it, but it's only that one toy. You can't get him to do anything else with any toy that you show him. You just, you just stumbled upon the toy that was just going to be perfect for that. Then you know, gosh, this isn't established. I really have to work on this. This is this. I wouldn't even call that really emerging yet. You can only do it with one thing. And so look at that and think, you know, that that's where I need to start. For a kid who has pretty good play skills, and for a kid, and a lot of kids with autism, you're automatically going to start back at that level two if they can already play because gestures and body movements are going to be hard for them. But for some kids, you say, okay, he's doing a little bit of that. Let me just see if I can get some play sounds. Let me just see what can happen here. And so lots of times, not necessarily with my kids with autism, but a lot of times I do start with level four and level five just to see what I can get uh, with what sticks there. And certainly that's our first little verbal piece in the chart. So if I just think cognitively this kid's doing pretty well and his receptive language is okay and his play is moving along, I'll start at four or five with a kid like that just to see what I can get. Uh, and I promised you this, so let's do this. I know we're nearly out of time, but this is a really important point that I want to say. Lots of kids with autism do have echolalia, and so we already talked about what does that mean. That means that they repeat, and so if they repeat, what does that mean? They've established uh, that verbal imitation piece, but remember, what do we say about that? Those kids don't necessarily link meaning with what they're saying, so that's a receptive language problem. So for those kids, we can use verbal routines to get more spontaneous language, and, and here, here's when I mostly use verbal routines with a kid with autism who's verbal. This is going to be a kid who has lots of labels. So if you encountered a child like this, you'll get a kid that, uh, and I've gotten a couple of these kids, actually more than a couple, maybe a dozen in my career, where they will already have a hundred words, 200 words, but they are only labeling and their moms know something is wrong here. He can't ever tell me. He can label banana on his uh, iPad, but then when we go in the kitchen and I know he wants a banana, he cannot say it. He can't ask for it. And so that's a pragmatic problem. And so with kids like this, a lot of times I'll use verbal routines just to get some other kind of language beyond labeling going. So just when they're filling in, so even if it's a word like the examples we used before like ashes ashes we all fall down with uh, ring around the rosies okay that's a preposition I'm going to teach him how to say this location word in this context but I want him to use it in another context and but that but I'm getting it going I'm getting it going there in the verbal routine piece and so that's certainly um, a situation that I wanted to share with um excuse me, with the starting points. All right, so let me give you a couple of uh, troubleshooting tips and other kinds of, uh, just to wrap up here, things that have, will make this easier for you. Uh, so let's just start with implementation. Be sure that you're going through the chart to figure out where a kid is. When you're looking at that, think, okay, he's here. Let me link this to his routines and to his activity preferences. So let's say that he is a kid who likes to jump on the bed or jump on a trampoline. You're going to say, okay, where, where is he with this? Where is he with this? What can I do? And so if he's an imitating gestures and body movements, you're going to have to teach him some movements to do while he's on that trampoline. And so you might think, oh, I'm going to teach him to, you know, uh, do little punches with that or I'm going to teach him to do some kicks or even let's just see if he'll fall down and even if he's jumping on the bed and you're kind of jumping beside the bed just fall on the floor and see if he'll imitate that you know tons of kids even those kids with autism who are disconnected a lot of the times will think it's so funny when you were doing that routine that they already like to do and you add something in there and and just see see where you get with that so look at what their routines are look at what their preferences are and then figure out how to work out these uh, ideas that you are going to do in sessions and that you're going to teach mom and dad to do. And I'll tell you what else I have parents do. I'll have them just make little lists and use sticky notes. And some parents will do it on their phone and that's okay. <coughs> but those sticky notes, so if it's at bath time and we want them working on imitating 
body movements. You know, I'll say with mom, well, what are some things we can do? Let's brainstorm. How about splashing? How about uh, you're going to wash the wall? You know, and that would be an action with an object, but that's okay. What about, um, you know, just come up with anything. Come up with anything that a mom could do during bath time. And you work on that. And then she has her little cue sheet for her there with the things that she's going to work on. And one more thing, too, is you've got to get this... You've got to kind of do it with their routines, but you remind parents, hey, I want you working on this all day long. So if a kid is at the play sound or exclamatory word level, you, you say, oh, I want you saying, you know, these 20 words. Let's think about these 20 exclamatory words. I want you inserting these wherever you can in every routine that you're doing because we're going to work on imitation all day long. And it's going to be easy for you because we've given you these these little targets for you to hit. So remember to talk about that. Uh, another thing that we need to work on this all day long with kids with the autism is they have so much difficulty generalizing. So a kid may literally associate you as, as the speech language pathologist with the person that he talks with. <laughs> and so he's going to say more with you and of course more with mom. Or who, but then maybe outside of therapy, he may use words at therapy that he doesn't use at home because mom hasn't really, really worked on them there. Or he may use words at home that you never hear at therapy, even when the context is right, because they have such difficulty with generalization. So uh, think about that and think about how important it is that you're all doing the same thing and that you're all, you know, working at the same level. And a lot of times with parents, it's just pulling them back saying he's not ready for words yet. He's not there yet. We can't get there yet. We got to back way up here. And so using something like uh, the visual chart from uh, Building Verbal Imitation in Toddlers or the chart in Autism Workbook is really, really going to help you with that. Because mom, you're going to say, mom, you're way down here at words, but guess what? He's way back up here at body movements and gestures, and we got to go through this stuff first. And so it really does help parents kind of stay on track um, and, and really work on the same things that, that you know that are going to move him forward so that that child ultimately reaches his or her goal, which is using words and phrases to communicate with others. All right, that's it. I hope you learned some new things today about imitation and certainly why imitation is so hard for kids with autism. I hope that you're sharing that information uh, with parents if you're a therapist or if you're a parent, you may share that with your therapist this week and talk about uh, what level your child is at with imitation and just talk with your therapist and see if you have the same opinion on uh, what you should be working on in regard to that. All right, that's all for today's show. You can get your CE credit at Teach Me to Talk and the link is right there below in the post. Thanks so much for watching. I'm Laura Mize, pediatric speech language pathologist, and join me next time for the next episode of the Autism Podcast Series.